infrastructure globally is undergoing a complete revolution. Over the next 40 years, the world will build more infrastructure than it has built in the past 4,000 years. Global spend on infrastructure today is running at about $3 trillion per annum and is forecast to increase to between six and nine trillion dollars per annum by 2025. More than 50% of that spend will take place in emerging markets and the Asia Pacific region. And this is an industry which is being transformed by technology, in particular the transport, the energy and the digital industries. And data and analytics is allowing us to plan, build, maintain, and operate infrastructure far more efficiently than ever before. Technology is washing across every aspect of what I'd call the infrastructure life cycle. It's affecting the way we plan infrastructure and prioritize it. It's affecting the way that we build infrastructure. It's affecting the way that we can maintain infrastructure. It's affecting the way that we operate infrastructure. And indeed, it's transforming entire industries that are connected with the infrastructure profession. And what I'd like to do is go through each of these in turn with a few examples to illustrate. Um, one of my observations would be that over, a lot of this is happening quite fast. Over the last couple of years, I would say, the planning of infrastructure development has moved to being far more analytical, far more data-driven, far more technocratic, if you like. A really, really good example, I believe, um, of this more technocratic approach to infrastructure planning and development uh, is here in the UK with the establishment of the National Infrastructure Commission. Um, uh, many of you will, will know, if you've, if you've read some of the pieces that I put in Building and Elsewhere over a number of years, uh, I've been long, long-standing um, advocate, stroke thorn in the side of various governments about the need to establish the National Infrastructure Commission. I was absolutely delighted when they did so. But I have to say, to be honest, I was worried. I was worried that um, the chances were it would either become so um, academic as, as, as really to be, to be irrelevant and not be able to have any impact in, in public policy, or it would be pretty controversial and it would very quickly find itself shut down. Um, I know it's early days, but I have been really impressed at the way in which the NIC seems to have found a middle course and has made, I would say, some extremely challenging um, uh, kickback, if you like, to, to public policy. Um, most recently in the National Infrastructure Assessment, challenging the government on, on whether new nuclear really is the future, challenging the government to embrace road pricing, for example, challenging the government to speed up um, the provision of full fibre um, optic uh, cabling to all premises in the country. Uh, and, and yet, did it, did it get any kickback in politics? No. In fact, on the contrary, government seems to have welcomed all of its announcements and said they're very helpful. Uh, and why is that? I, I think it's because the work that is being done by the NIC is, is so um, well-researched, so well-founded, so well-argued, that actually it's quite difficult to attack. Um, and this, and this um, more analytical approach to infrastructure, taking some of these debates out of the realms of, of simply a trade between politicians, is happening all over the world. Um, other examples that we could turn to, uh, we, you talked about digital twins earlier, um, Richard, some of you will know that Singapore is in the process of creating a digital twin of the entire city-state so they can effectively do scenario planning on paper before they actually have to go in there and start moving diggers and so on. Um, at Canada, uh, in August, published its first ever um, uh, uh, infrastructure survey which captures not only the totality of what the, the, the country owns in terms of its infrastructure, but also a view of its, of its condition. The KPMG last year published its 11th Global Construction Survey, um, 
where 93% of those who responded, and they come from both owners and supply chain in the industry globally, 93% of those who responded said they believed technology was going to be transformational in terms of changing their business. But only 5% said they were anywhere close to being cutting edge, and only 10% were on any routine basis using you know, digital tools or you know, any form of, of additive manufacturing or, or anything like that. Um, and, and why is this? It's a theme I'm going to come back to when we get into talking about the, the governance and the collaboration of the industry, which is, is the fragmentation of the industry, I believe, is, is one of its biggest challenges. And in particular, there's a disconnect between the financial value that arises in the supply chain, the financial value which arises in the hands of the owner of the infrastructure, and the value which accrues to the end user. These are all disconnected in the value chain, if you like, of infrastructure. Um, and where that takes you to, and again, I've got some more material later on that talks about this in a bit more detail, but where this takes you to um, is uh, in the supply chain of the industry, the margins are so low and the certainty of the future is so low that there has never been the money to invest. So it's an industry that doesn't invest in technology to anything like the extent it should do. Um, the construction sector deal, which was published earlier this year, has many, many pages, which I don't think will make any difference to anybody. But the one thing that is in it, the one thing that is in it which I really applaud, um, is the concept of um, uh, co-investment in cutting-edge innovation in the industry, bringing together both public and private industry money in the same way as we've seen successfully in the automotive and the aerospace industries over the last 20 years, that co-investment in, in innovation. Two years ago, um, KPMG decided to take a look at, to try to understand why. Why was it, even though in principle there was a saving to be made, the industry wasn't adopting the saving? And, and, we, and we published a case study uh, which was based on the Leadenhall building in London, um, which as some of you will know, it was a Langer Rourke, um, uh, very significantly off-site um, construction. Um, and Langerot were very kind and they shared with us um, a lot of information about the cost of the construction off-site basis. Um, uh, and then we used sort of standard industry metrics in order to produce a model of what we thought it would have cost had it been built on-site. And the conclusion we came to was it actually cost more, about 10% more, to build it on an off-site basis, which I have to say is consistent with many other examples that are out there in the industry. Um, but the view, both of Langer Rourke and the client, uh, was that the construction was brought in at least six months early as a result of being built off-site. And when you took into account and overlaid the rental values in London being achieved at the time, the value of that building being opened six months earlier turned that additional cost into a more than 7% benefit in the hands of the client. Now, in that particular case, there was a client that recognised that potential, or maybe they were just prepared to take a punt, but the vast majority of clients just think in terms of the upfront cost, so they never access that benefit. And, of course, that's just looking at a single build, whereas the real, the real benefit of moving into a manufactured environment in construction is the ability to replicate because then, of course, as with any standard economics, you'd expect to get a, an economy of, of scale. We obsess as an industry about the construction phase, but in practice, it only represents about 30% of the value of the total life of the asset. And I believe that one of the things that's most exciting about the application of data analytics into our industry is the ability to start to get a real handle on delivering whole life value for money in construction. Today, still, most asset maintenance decisions are taken on the basis of engineering judgment. But we're rapidly moving to a world where, particularly with the use of sensors on assets and then the predictive analytics you could do on the information that comes off the sensors on those assets, you can start, we can start to move into a, effectively a data-driven maintenance world. But the reliance on human memory uh, and the reliance on engineering judgment 
um, is rapidly changing. I think the combination of geos geospatial mapping of assets um, and the use of sensors and the asset analytics off the back of it um, is completely changing the way in which we manage in this industry. Um, and what we're already seeing is best-in-class clients um, adopting these sorts of techniques. So um, Orange, the mobile telecommunications company, uh, I was listening to one of their executives speak a couple of weeks ago, um, and he said that they were now using predictive analytics by which they believed that they could anticipate seven days in advance failures on their network, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and I can't tell you which one, but, but KPMG is, is now working with one of the major retailers um, in the UK uh, in order to create, firstly, a digital fixed asset register for all of their stores and all of their warehouses, um, but not just for the sake of having a, a fixed asset register, but with, for the ability to be able to move effectively into a data-driven approach to their maintenance. And the reason all this is important comes back to this whole point about whole life, because if we can get some really powerful data about the history of how assets, um, uh, how asset condition changes over life, about interventions and so on, then we can move into a world in which we can optimise our asset maintenance. And that's hugely important because for assets that are owned by, by the public sector, it goes straight to delivering best value for us as taxpayers. And obviously, if it's a private company, then it goes straight to the bottom line interests of their shareholders. Technology is also transforming the way in which we operate our assets. Um, and at the heart of this is a recognition that in this future world, or this world which I think is now upon us, the data is actually more valuable than the physical asset. Um, and, but, but if we're going to take the, if we're going to be able to capture the value of that data, then I believe that data needs to be transparent, shared, and arguably publicly owned. Now, I've been arguing along those lines for a couple of years, um, but I have to say, uh, I, I, so I was amazed um, when the National Infrastructure Commission um, came out with its report um, uh, in November last year uh, called Data for the Public Good. Um, uh, because it's, it, it's a hugely, I think, challenging report, if you like. Nothing like it's been produced anywhere else in the world. Um, and this document says there should be a presumption that the data that is held by both public and private entities providing public services should be shared unless that data is personal data. So effectively, it tries to sweep away the concept of, of commercial, commercially confidential data on the basis that it's only by sharing this data that we can really deliver the best public policy outcomes. And as some of you may know, there's now a working committee that's been set off off the back of that to look at what that might mean in practice. And, and, and the final piece is, is this transformational change, um, which I... Um, you know, I think we can all see is coming in particular the transport and the energy industries. Um, as the price of batteries falls from the um, $1,000 <coughs> per megawatt hour that it was in 2010 to the 200 that it is today, to the 100 that it's predicted to be in 2025, so I am convinced we will see uh, a pretty sudden mass switch of consumers across into electric vehicles. Um, and KPMG's estimate is that by 2021, um, the whole life ownership cost of an electric vehicle will, will, will go lower than the whole life ownership cost of a petrol diesel vehicle. Um, and at that point, the bottom, by the way, will fall out of the petrol and diesel market. So don't own a petrol diesel car and expect to sell it for anything like its uh, original value or even a fraction thereof at that point in time. Um, and, and as we then overlay in that world um, universal 5G coverage and that full fibre optic coverage I was talking about a moment ago, then we create the conditions for level 5 autonomous vehicles, um, which is why the NIC is right to say that investment in 5G and fibre optic and, and electric charging as well are fundamental for the future of the UK. And, and the... I believe that the impact on all of us in this room and everyone in society in this will be absolutely transformational. This isn't, this isn't incremental change. It will, it will completely change the way in which we travel. And by the way, it will then disrupt the entirety of the logistics industry. 
because 70% of the cost of moving goods in a, in, a, in, a, in a van today is the cost of the individual sat in the cab. So you completely change the economics of the supply chain of logistics in this world as you go. Project 13 at Root is trying to address uh, something we're all familiar with, which is the industry's woeful productivity. Uh, you'll have heard the stat many times before. I'm sure that UK construction productivity has been basically flat for 20 years. Uh, although I have to say, one pedant in an audience did tell me about a year ago that wasn't true. It had actually increased 0.8% over those 20 years. But so why? Why is this? Well, it comes back to the theme that I was talking about before, um, which is, well, maybe, maybe we can just say it's... It's all the construction industry's fault because they don't invest. We have low productivity because the construction industry doesn't invest in, in skills and people and doesn't, and doesn't invest in, in technology. Um, but the premise of Project 13 is that is not correct. Project 13 lines up with the Latham, the Egan, the Wollstenholme reports in terms of um, its analysis, if you like, of, of the challenge of the industry. But the crucial difference is that Project 13 says the responsibility for change lies at the door of the owners and the procurers of infrastructure. And the reason for that takes us back to a point I made earlier, um, which is about the massive fragmentation of the construction industry. So this is, uh, this, is, this is January 2007 stats because that was a point in time when it was possible for us to pull together a view across the whole of the top 100 contractors at that time. Um, nearly 60% of them were making less than a 2.5% margin and 17 of them were loss making. And as we, as, as we all know, uh, but KPMG has been tracking it for many, many, many years, this is not remotely a one-off. I mean, this is, this is just how the, how the industry is. Um, the construction supply chain um, is therefore um, inherently and perpetually unstable. And the focus is on survival for the next few years. But infrastructure is about building assets for 100 years. And this, I think, is the nub of the problem. We are trying to use a short-term industry to build long-term outcomes. And it just doesn't work. And Project 13 is about asking the owners and procurers of infrastructure in this country specifically, both public and private, to accept that there is no power in the supply chain to change this. So there's no point berating them. The power really lies with the owners. And as it happens in the UK today, if you look across the spend, something like 70% of the total spend in infrastructure in the UK today is being undertaken by about 15 organisations. You know, Highways England, National um, uh, Highways England, uh, um, the Railways, um, Thames Water, Environment Agency. You know, a small number of organisations, they can exercise, they can exercise power in this industry in a way that the supply chain can't. But to make this stick, we need governance reform. Um, and so my role in Project 13 is, is uh, I chaired one of the five work streams, which was the work stream around governance. Um, and um, in particular, we said, um, OK, so we're focusing on the boards of these asset owners, but we're also recognising that they are acting under the influence of investors. So that might be the Treasury. In, the, in, in government, so the rules that Treasury set obviously have a profound impact on the way in which government departments procure infrastructure in this country and tends to make them quite short-termist and tends to focus on cost to build rather than the long-term long -term, uh, asset um, value. And similarly, investors in the private sector, with some notable exceptions, and Hermes was, was on our group because Hermes, for example, is one of the institutional investors who are recognising and getting the whole industry to recognise that actually they should be all about long-term stewardship of assets for the benefit of society, not just focusing on the short-term margin and trying to squeeze the cost out short-term. So we recognise the, the role of investors, um, and we also recognise that there was an important role for regulators who can either help um, embed these principles in the companies they regulate, um, or indeed they could frustrate the way that we're trying to go. 
Um, and um, amongst other things that we produced, uh, we took the corporate code um, and we produced effectively an, an, an infrastructure interpretation, infrastructure owner's interpretation of the corporate code. Um, uh, and we've also entered into a dialogue, as you would expect, with government about what it would take for government to adopt the principles that Project 13 represents. But I do think a big, big challenge um, for our construction industry um, is that in the minds of the, the population at large, if you like, um, uh, it's seen as being all about mud, delays, cost overrun and conflict. Um, and I think technology will come to our rescue on some of these things. If we could build more off-site, then we can spend less, less time wading in mud. Um, uh, if we can fully embrace building information modelling, uh, digital approaches to um, you know, the optimization of works on site, the use of um, uh, predictive analytics around external external externalities like weather, for example. Uh, and by the way, Aon is out in the market offering a product around that which is backed on uh, by predictive analytics at the moment. Um, then, then, then we ought to be able to deliver projects uh, on time and on budget uh, with more frequency than we do today. And um, if we embrace the principles of Project 13, then maybe we can spend less time in court, um, which I would have thought, particularly for this audience, would be something that you would all thoroughly welcome. Um, there are a lot of organisations out there um, which are doing good work in terms of facing off to um, uh, the young people and others who, who are the future of, of the construction industry. Um, KPMG's had a very long association, for example, with the Construction Youth Trust. But I have to say, whilst being a huge supporter of the Construction Youth Trust, I, it's always struck me as bizarre that this is an industry that seems to rely a lot on charities to reach out to its workforce. Um, and it comes back to a theme again, that this is an industry that is too fragmented. We need more leadership. Um, and whilst we could sit back and wait for technology to, uh, to come to our rescue, um, as I set out in the article in Building Magazine, I really think there are some pretty simple things that we could be doing as a construction industry um, with some leadership that brings it all together um, in order to make it much easier for individuals to get into the industry, to understand what it's about, to develop their skills within the industry. But the image of our industry, of course, um, is about more than just sustainability. Um, it's about focusing, I would argue, on the ultimate outcomes of what we are trying to achieve in societies, whether those are in emerging markets or developed ones like the UK. Um, the general public's involvement with construction um, tends to be characterised by roadworks and delays on the railway and you know, local conflict over energy to waste plants or new housing schemes. So programmes like Crossrail's £15 billion railway or the £5 billion super sewer, I think, um, have, have a huge impact in terms of public perception um, and paint a picture of, of construction um, actually delivering a great public good. Um, but I think we should be bolder still about the message that we take out into society. Um, infrastructure for me is, 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 is the foundation of civilization. Whether it's Roman roads or subsea internet cables, whether it's oil and gas pipelines or, or cutting edge medical facilities, um, construction is an industry that designs, builds and maintains the infrastructure that delivers those public outcomes. So what we do as a construction industry has a huge impact in society. 